a time of worship, a time of praise unto the Lord. Heavenly Father, we love you so much, and we thank you, God, for your hand on our lives. We thank you, Lord, for... Oh, we are grateful to you, Lord. Lord, we ask now that you guide us, that you go before us this morning, Father, in the power of your Holy Spirit. May each one of us, each one of us, have a fresh encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Lord, through your Spirit, through your Word, through worship, worship and the Word, what a great combination, Lord. And it is so wonderful that you've given that unto us. Lord, now just guide us as we just lift up our hands, as we praise you, for we give you all the praise and glory. It's in Jesus' name. And together we said, amen. amen. Let's worship the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Happy Valentine's. Happy <laughs> Valentine's. <laughs> I think we're going to start that again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. T testing. Okay.
get your blood flowing. <laughs> To those around me, 
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
friend. I will worship you until the very end. I love you. I need you. Though my world may fall, I'll never let you go.
people said? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the, the wonderful worship, Lord, that we just had. Lord, you are so good. Lord, we are grateful to you. Lord, speak to our hearts this morning as we continue to worship you in Jesus' name. And together we said, Amen. Amen. Would you turn around and say good morning to the person to your right, and left, and front, and back. <laughs> Welcome to Higher Ground. Praise the Lord. Praise God. <laughs> God is good all the time. Oh, you better believe it. It's so good to see you this morning. It's a little brisk out there, isn't it? Yeah, just a tad, as they say. Um, we are excited to see what God is doing. Um, this past week, we had our Vision 2021 and going into 2022. And we had a large group of people here that night, and we are excited to implement those things. And we are going to be rolling those out, as they say, as the months progress. So I just want to share a couple of things with you. First of all, uh, what's happening here, happy Valentine's Day. Yeah. <laughs> Praise God. Happy Valentine's Day to all the ladies here and everything. A couple of things we want to share with you regarding today and regarding what's taking place, happening soon. Uh, some of the things we'll be having. We're going to be, by the grace of the Lord, February 28th, back in our higher ground building. Yeah. That beautiful building that's standing right here. Yes. That, uh, yes. Although An Angelo and a whole team of people have to clean out the cobwebs and everything that have been hanging in. No. But um, also, so much work has to be done and everything with Bob and the team from media, uh, the web, the Facebook, the, you know, the sound system, the the projection system and everything, but by the grace of God, we'll be in there, and uh, we are we are thrilled. That's going to be a soft opening, as they call it in business, a soft opening, because the big opening is going to be on March the 28th, a month later, which is Palm Sunday, and the Lord has just blessed us with this. We are excited to have just a major grand opening, uh, what God is doing, and it's exciting. One of the things we want to announce here this morning also is that we're gearing up, just like the things that we talked about this past week, uh, the Sunday schools and the nursery is going to be opening up, but we're going to be needing uh, also people to help staff that uh, with the, uh, the nursery as far as Sunday school is concerned. Uh, we're going to be needing a lot of people, and Lloyd is working on that, getting that together. But if you would like to volunteer for nursery or Sunday school, please come and see Pastor Jack or myself will get you all signed up because there's a protocol that we have to go through for that and everything. And so there's a lot of stuff that's going to be happening there, and we are just excited about it and seeing what God's doing. A couple of the things, uh, marriage ministry, and that resumes on Saturday, February the 27th at 6 p.m. And bring a potluck dish 
uh, basically to share that day. And so everything is kind of gearing back up again. And I'm excited about that because things were like kind of dormant. And now we're kind of, you know, moving along. You know, you start to fire on six cylinders, then seven, then eight cylinders. You know where I'm going on that. And then you're, then you're moving. And so these are the things that are happening here. The School of Ministry, and I am really jazzed about this. Uh, these past six weeks, uh, we had John Rittenhouse here, and he was teaching in some incredible teaching. But that's just a taste of what's happening, because starting this Tuesday, that's February the 16th, all the way through uh, March the 23rd, the next class is going to be on spiritual warfare. And that's a pretty powerful statement, a pretty powerful topic. And we're going to be having that. Dave and Dennis are going to be teaching that, and so that's going to be Starting this Tuesday evening, right inside here, uh, we'll have the, you know, the social distancing, we'll have the mask and everything for people here, but uh, we're looking forward to that because that gives us some great teaching as to how we should deal with the spiritual aspect in our lives. Because you are, as John pointed out this past week, and I think most of you know, you're not a body with a spirit. You're a spirit in a body. Your, your soul is inside this body, and this is the package. This package, one day we leave this package, and praise the Lord, we leave this package with all of its aches and pains and headaches and back aches and whatever kind of ache you, you've got. I won't get personal, but, uh, you know, so it's exciting to see how can we develop our spiritual understanding. And so that's what's going to be taking place on Tuesday evening. A solutions Ministry Solutions starts back up on Monday, March the 1st at 7 p.m. And it's going to be meeting downstairs. Uh, a biggie, and we had this in the bulletin here, and Chris just gave me this as well. This is, this is super. It's this Women's Fellowship, and they're going to be having a Mother's Day tea for the women, for the moms. Yes, praise God. Come and join the fellowship. There's, there's music, there's teaching, there's shopping, there's tea, there's goodies. Uh, mothers and daughters, friends, and uh, you know, neighbors are invited. Uh, fun hats and uh, you know, all kinds of other stuff that's going to be happening. There's a $5 cost to it, but it's Saturday, May the 1st of 2021 from 1 o'clock until 3.30 p.m. And sign up at the women's ministry table. That's inside the lobby downstairs here. And it's going to be a great time. We are very excited to see, again, all these ministries fire back up again. Um, I've asked Pastor Jack this morning to bring forth the Word of God. Today is Valentine's Day, and it's all about L-O-V-E, love. A long time ago, there were four guys that wrote a song, All You Need Is Love. Those four guys, you know those four guys. Those four guys? Love is the basis of what God does with you and I. Love one another. It's all about love. In a world, it seems, that is void of love today. Or we talk about love, but Pastor Jack today is going to share the heart of love and what it means. So with any further ado, I want to bring up Pastor Jack. God bless you guys. Boy, after that, hello. <laughs> After that intro, I'm a little nervous now. Is it just me, or am I hearing echoes in my head? <laughs> Let's open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come before you again in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, I give you praise and honor this morning and I, for allowing me the privilege of standing before the congregation. Father, I pray you would take away any inadequacies in the flesh, Father God, and let your word come forth boldly. Father, I pray that you would open the hearts of your people and you would give them a sense of excitement and expectation of what you're going to do through them and for them. So, Father, we pray this morning, everything would glorify you and everything we do. We ask all of this in your most precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Now, you do know what Pastor Rex was saying. It's Valentine's Day. Uh, men, how many of you have already figured out what you're doing for your wives? Amen. You came to church, right? I mean, <laughs> praise the Lord. You know, there's some do's and don'ts on Valentine's Day. I always, you know, the remark about for the women. Valentine's, Valentine's Day is a day of love, but isn't that a two-way street, men and women? It's always the guy that goes out and buys the flowers and uh, the candy or whatever it might be. But don't you think it should be reciprocal? 
I mean, coming back to, I'm just asking. I mean, it's the two, you fell in love and supposedly she fell in love with you. So in my life, with my wife, bless her heart, I've always incorporated both sides. I think it's only fair. My wife likes to travel and I like to travel, so I'll pick out a weekend and I'll say, honey, we've never been to Denver. It's my privilege to take it. Beautiful restaurants, we know friends there. Beautiful place to go. Now, see, in the back of my mind, when we landed and got a nice hotel, I took her out eating, nice shopping, but it just so happens that evening I had tickets to the Bronco game. So I figure, oh. no, I'm just being honest. I, I don't think it was selfish. I, she had beautiful restaurants, a beautiful time, and we went to the Broncos, and I was blessed, you know, and she put up with me. So the next day, we're in Denver, and, and we go out to different restaurants, shopped in a different area. And she goes, what do we do tonight? And I say, I just happened to have tickets to Colorado's Rocky game that was in town, so we went to the Rockies game. So I figured we were blessed, blessed, amen? Isn't that what Valentine's is supposed to be? And I pray today, man, that your day ends up better. You do know the, how the beginning of Valentine's Day. There was a gentleman, St. Valentine. He was a Christian priest. Um, it was back in the third century. Uh, he was a Catholic priest. Um, <laughs> Roman Empire was a pagan society. You know that. And since Christianity was starting to take a hold, Emperor, I think it was Claudius II in the third century, made a decree. If you married into anyone that Christianity, it was punishable by death. And uh, St. Valentine so fell in love with love. Anybody who fell in love, no matter what the consequences, he would marry him. So eventually he got caught and he got imprisoned, imprisoned. And the story goes that what happened next, while he was in prison, the jailer's daughter was blind. And he had the opportunity to minister to her and heal her blindness. And they, they developed a relationship, and he just loved ministering to her. So as the day drew close where he was going to be executed, he left a note that said how much he enjoyed his time with her. And it was signed, Love Valentine. And it was given to her the next morning when he was executed, February 14th, 2070. He died, and that was the birth of Valentine's Day. So, man, I pray your day turns out better than St. Valentine's Day does. <laughs> Amen? So, let's, you know, Pastor Rex is right. Today, I, I had the privilege of standing before you, and it's Valentine's Day, so what other topic could I preach on but love? Um, now, having said that, love takes so many different, in our English language, in the same breath, we can say we love tacos, and we can say we love our spouse. Same word in the English language, but I hope it's worlds apart. And scripturally, we would be well served to get God's version of what love is. And let me go back to the beginning. From the moment you were conceived and you came out of your mother's womb, there was an inherent desire that was built inside of you for love. You had a need for care, for attention from day one. The reason a baby wants to be held and his mother's arms is for that sense of love, that sense of connection. Even when you get older, the toddlers, how they love to cuddle right next to you. They have to have that sense of love, connection. I can even give you a more personal uh, antidote to that. I love my mom and dad dearly. They're both in heaven with the Lord, and I praise the Lord. And they were great, great parents. And we, uh, they were born and raised in Arkansas. And I guess it's a different mentality. I'm not real sure how it came about. But never in my upbringing, till I was 30 years old, did I ever hear I love you in my house. Not to me, not to my sister. And I've never heard my dad tell my mom he loved her. And I never heard my mom tell my dad he loved her. Now, I knew they did by their actions. And, and I, was, I, I needed love so bad, I would ask my mom. I'd say, Mom, I love you. And she would say, me too, honey. Like that, back to me. I'd tell my dad, I love you. And he goes, I know. I, I never would I get it back. And I asked my dad, I said, why don't you ever say I love you? And he says, eh, men don't say that. You know, we, we, you just know it's there, but you don't say it. That's not what a man does. 
So never in my life, as God my witness, did I ever hear I love you. And then, ever since I was a little kid, and I bring the story to end real quick, ever since I was a little kid, I had this premonition. I wouldn't live a day past 30. I said it in junior high, I said it in high school. When I met my wife and proposed and got married, I said, I gotta be honest with you. I, I mean, it's just a premonition. I don't know why I have it, but I've had it as a kid. I will not live a day past 30. Now, the reason I bring that up, two days before my 30th birthday, you know where Richie Canyon is, where you go around the, you know the, the barriers they have there? I'm the reason for those barriers. <laughs> it was a rainy, cold, cold day we had where the rain turned into that black ice around that corner. I went around that corner and started to straighten out, and I guess my van just, just started sliding toward there, and I realized I was heading for the, the cliff. And I was praying like no man can pray. <laughs> and by the grace of God, I thought he answered my prayer because it stopped. Whew. It's like a roller coaster. I had already cleared the cliff. It just hadn't went down yet. So I went down end over end. On the way down, all I could think is, I was right. <laughs> I, I was right. I hit the bottom. When it hit, it blew me out the side door. And all I got out of it was a little bit of a cracked head and uh, a busted shoulder and a busted wrist. The doctor says, two days, in two days, you're going to have to have a shoulder replacement. And the two days is on my birthday. Now, remember my premonition, right? So I, I tell my wife, and the doctor was going to do it, we know personally. I said, change the date. I do not want it on, on my birthday because of my, my fear and my premonition. And he's a Christian man, Dr. Job. And he came to me and says, you're going to get it done on the 30th. You know, the God you serve and I serve determines the time, not you, you know. And, and I went along that, but I got to be honest. I, I, I had a fear of this premonition. But I bring that up because my mom's never said, I love you, right? So in my hospital room, right before the surgery, my wife's there, and she comes up and kisses me and tells me how much she loves me. They're coming in to take me away. And my mother, for the first time in my life, looked at me and says, I love you, son. And everything changed at that moment. I had no fear of the, of the, the operation. I had no, it was just a sense of something I needed my whole life. And to see my mom tell me, I love you, and I've never quit saying it since. My, you, you ask my kids, they will tell I tell my kids 15 times a day. When they were growing up playing soccer, it was a good play. I'd hug them and say, I love you, I love you. And they'd say, Dad, please don't. You're embarrassing me. I'd pick them up at school and scream out, I love you. Goodbye, I love you. You know, don't forget. And I wouldn't let them go until they say it back. I, I, I will never have my kids doubt that there's love. So if that, that word is used so much, wouldn't be, we be well served to understand God's perception of what that word is? I mean, we literally use it for everything in our lives. We, we love TV. We love where we go. We love what we, where we eat. There should be a distinction of some kind between loving tacos and loving your spouse or loving your God. So let's get into scripture this morning. You know, if we're really going to search the Bible, it, get, it cuts right to the chase. 1 John 4.8 says this, Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Now listen to the words again. Again, you might make notes. 1 John 4.8, Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Isn't that kind of an indicting statement? Whoever does not love does not know God. We do be well served to find out what God means by that word love. Because if we're coming up short and we have a different perception and it's just surface level, it says that we don't even know God unless we have the love that God's talking about here. So I would say it's imperative we go deep enough, we have a working understanding of what God's telling us here. In fact, I'll go a little bit further. The Bible summarizes, Jesus summarizes the whole Bible in two verses. In Matthew 22, verse 34 through 40, and I'll just paraphrase it. 
he was asked what the greatest commandments were. And he says the first is love. And again, there's that word love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself, which is the second commandment. But again, that word love. So let's look at the importance of that word love to God in those two scriptures. Everything in this book is predicated on love. If we can love the way God wants love to be, if we can love God with all our heart, all our soul, and all of our mind, and we can love our neighbors with, as we love ourselves, then everything in this Bible will take its natural place. Everything hinges on those two verses. So again, the imperative desire to know what God means by that love. 1 John 4.12 says, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Again, the imperative to learn what God means by love. The Greek words that are used for word, there's four words that are used for, word, or for love or a form of love. And it's used for different reasons at different times. And we're going to look at each one of these words. The four words are agape, storhe, philea, and eros. And each one has a different connotation, but it's well worth our time to see what God says about these. We're going to start with philea, which is brotherly love. It's where we get the word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And for most of us in this room, what we have for each other here is brotherly love. You know, I, I, it's because of my bringing up with my dad and all, and you don't say love. When I first got into the church in the men's study, I love you, brother. That was so awkward for me. I mean, I definitely had a friendship with these men, but to use that word love was just awkward to me. And God had to really work inside of me to show what brotherly love is. It is love. But it's a friendship love. It's what, what we have as a congregation toward each other. It's what the disciples had toward each other. Amen. That, that, that is what brotherly love is. That is what philea love is. And I can go even one further. After Jesus died on the cross and after his resurrection, after Peter denied him three times. Y'all remember that? I mean, he, he, he told the Lord, I will never leave you. I will die for you. And he scattered like a little girl. And, and the Lord said what was going to happen. And can you imagine when they were taken away? After he denied them the third time, and, and the Lord was being taken away. Remember what it said in the Bible? And he looked at Jesus, and he cried. Can you imagine when he realized he denied his Lord three times? And yet, after the resurrection, face to face with Jesus, these are the words that Jesus used. Do you love me? Now, the word that, that Jesus used there was agape, and I'll explain what that word means in a minute. But three times he asked, do you love me? And when Peter says, Lord, yes, I love you, the word that he used back was philea, which is brotherly love. But because Jesus knew what was in front of Peter and, and what he needed in his heart in order to shepherd the flock, that kind of love, he asked him again, do you love me? Agape love. And again, Peter's response was Philea, brotherly love, because he had no concept of what agape love is. And, and it goes further. Let me, let, me, let me stop you there and... John 13, 35 says, By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And again, the word that's used there is phileo, brotherly love. So that's the framework of what that word means. The second word, Greek word, is storge, S-T-O-R-G-E. It's family love. It's like what you have for your children. You, you just naturally, that's my dad. Of course you love them. That's my, your mom. Of course you love her. You're, as a parent, when you, when you grab that child, you don't think about it. It's inherently there. That's Dorje love. And, and it's, I can give you examples of that. Remember when, uh, 
Martha and Mary, when Lazarus was dying, and, and they were so grieving for his condition, and he wanted Jesus to come to save him. That's family love. That's Dorhe love. That's inherently there because of your family setting. It's one level above phileo love. But, but it's a reality in all of our lives. We have it for our children, unless I hope you do. I mean, nobody asks you when that child, do you love that child? You inherently just knew the moment that child was born. There was a bond and a love there. Absolutely. As a child, when you know your parent, do you love your, your mom and dad? Well, they're my mom and dad. Of course I do. They never sat there and consciously made a middle, I'm going to start loving my dad and mom. It's inherently there. That's store hey love. It's part of our life. The next one is Eros love, and it gets a bad rap. It's where we get the word erotic or erotica, and it's turned into be something that the word was never meant to be. As in a marriage between a man and woman, God physically bent up, bent in or, or made, if you will, an acceptable behavior that was a gift from God inside of a marriage, and it stands for romantic love. It stands for a passion. It doesn't have to necessarily be physical. It's a passion you have toward that person. If you ever want to just sit down and have a good read, read Song of Solomon, the first few chapters, and it really describes in detail this word, the love a man has or a woman has for a husband, for his kisses, for his caress, for that passion, for that, that, that intimacy. And it's completely acceptable in the relationship of a marriage. But out of all the words for love and the, all the forms of love, it's the only one, if it's searched out without restraint, becomes a sin and becomes sexual immorality. If you take that desire outside of marriage, it becomes a sin and it becomes sexual immorality. That's why it gives you the parameters and the relationship only in marriage, but it's still a gift from God and it's a form of love. And then the last one, of course, is agape love. When it says in scripture that God is love, this is what agape, it's unconditional, it's sacrificial, and it's committed to, and it's by choice. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's not because of what we were back to him, he loved us so much, he, is, he gave his only son that we can have eternal life with him. And, and the agape word, let me, let me give you the best definition. They gave us this definition in Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Listen to these words. This is agape love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. It's a perfect definition of agape love. It should be by the standard by which we long for, we strive for. Never will our attempt at agape love ever meet what God's love is. His standard is perfect and is pure. Us as sinners down here, it should be what we strive for. But you can never have agape love in your life without the help of the Holy Spirit. In and of ourselves, outside of Christ, there is absolutely no hope for agape love. We're self-centered, we want what we want, and we always will, short of the Holy Spirit inside of us. We're a new creation in Christ, and what we couldn't do in and of ourselves, we can do with the Holy Spirit. We can have agape love. We can start esteeming those around us, our spouses, more important than us. It goes against every grain in your body. If you're starved and your children are starved and there's only, you got four people eating at the table and there's only three chicken legs, what is your first, and, I mean, first thought in your head? Man, I'm going to be first to that table and get one of those. <laughs> it's our human nature. You put two babies together on the floor and one toy, nobody taught those kids to grab it and say, mine. It's inherently who we are. 
We're selfish by nature. Short of the Holy Spirit, that's the way we will always be. That's why this is so important. We grasp what's agape love. It changes everything in who we are. It changes our marriages. It changes raising our children, what we say, what we don't say, and the reason we don't say it or the reason we do say it. If we understand that we're esteeming and their needs are greater than our needs, it changes everything in the world. Think if my only thought was to please my wife, whether there's anything reciprocal about it or get anything back, if my only thought is what could make my wife's day better today, forget the cost to me, whatever would put a smile on her face. Now, hypothetically, let's just say that through the Holy Spirit, God's gifted me enough that I can at least come close to that, right? And let's say my wife was in the same boat. She's praying that God give me that agape love toward my husband. And her only desire is to make me happy or what my needs are. Can you see how those two lives overlap? And man, how could it be any better than that? If she's just trying to make me happy and I'm just trying to meet her needs and make her happy, there is such an overlap for mistake, it doesn't matter. We're all rowing in the same direction. That's what agape love is. But the minute you take agape love out, now let, let me give you an example. Let's, let's go back to the different types of love. Let's go to play a love, brotherly love, right? All of these loves are different forms and different intensities but they're all to be sprinkled with agape love. And let me, let me give you an example. If you go back to brotherly love, Philea, right? I love you, brother. Now, now, without agape love sprinkled on that, this is the way this works out. You come to me and you say, hey, my fence blew down that last windstorm. If you got a few minutes to come over and give me a hand, because I can't do it. My, I've got a bad leg, a bad shoulder. I was just hoping, brother, you could help me, okay? Now, without agape love, I look at you and say, hey, I love you, brother. But, you know, I'm a, I'm a little busy. You know, the, the, the Lakers play at 5 o'clock, and I'm not real sure I can make it. I'm not a pagan, and he is my brother in Christ, and I do love him. But I'm not that concerned about his needs. I mean, let's be honest. Have we all not been there at times? And, and you think, man, I have my own life to live, Right? See, that's, that's phileo love without being sprinkled with agape love. See, if we're just doing it at a surface level, we're not what God wants us to be. Let's go to store, store hey, family love. <laughs> How many times if, if you ask, somebody asks you, do you love the, I mean, one of your kids, I have eight kids, and you're bound to have a few rebellious ones, amen? <laughs> I mean, by the grace of God, they all turned out relatively good kids. But during those hard times, one of the other kids would look at me and say, do you love him? Now, listen, without, without agape mixed in here, of course he does. He's my kid. What choice do I have? Right? I mean, inherently, he's my son or daughter, and what choice do I have? Or with agape sprinkled in, of course I love him. And how can we work this out? See, without agape... All you're thinking is 18, that sucker's out the door, right? I mean, how many parents have been there? I mean, they're cute up to those teenage years, amen? And then there's some drastic changes. But, but I mean, how many parents, again, if you're just looking at from store hay, and you have this inherent love, but it's only responsibility and obligation, man, 18, can't get here close enough. But, if you have that sprinkled with agape, man, you dread the day they leave that house. You, you really do. And, and you know, all the, the scriptures, even Eros, which, like, again, gives them a bad name, but sprinkled with agape in a, in a great marriage done God's way. It's the most remarkable thing in the world. But outside of that, it's just an act that you turn into sin and sexual immorality. So all of the different forms and intensities of love are predicated and permeated by a copy of love. That's the way God meant it from the very beginning. Everything can change when it's sprinkled with a copy of love. 
Let me read you some scriptures. I was going to do a PowerPoint for me, but I thought all this was going to be stripped out and I wouldn't have the capabilities, so I apologize, but I just got it on notes. But I want to go back to Matthew 22, 37 through 39. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now Ephesians 5.25 well, let me, let me just stop with the Matthew one. If you shall love your Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. If the word's agape, and agape means sacrificial, completely committed to, desiring that person's needs, will, more than your own. Now, take that definition in context of our falling in love with Jesus Christ and wanting to serve him. Do we consider our will more important or his will? See, in the flesh, we want help, but we want God to help us work out our needs our way. But in agape love, I'm not concerned about my needs or my way. I'm concerned what God wants in my life and how I can serve him to meet his needs. See, that's, that's how we get it reversed. In the flesh, I want God. I, I pray. How many of us in our prayer life have a prayer list, God, help me in this, this, and this, and this, and it's all things I want or need by my perception. Whatever happened to not my will, but your will. If this is a valley you want me to go through, then God, give me the grace to get through it. I have a deal in my office that says, if God brings, if he brings you to a point, no, let me... Pastor Rex, what does it say in my office? <laughs> he reads it every day he comes in. What, what? God will not lead you where grace will not protect you. And, and that is so true. But how many times in our life, our prayer life is only predicated on what we want, and we're asking God to help us get it. You know, I, and, and, and that, again, once we get to agape love and understand that my needs are secondary to God's wants. And in Jeremiah, he, he wants to prosper us, to give us a sense of hope, not to harm us. And we have to embrace that. And I also want you to understand all those different types of love, they overlap. And that's important to know. My wife is not only my wife. She's family, obviously. She's the mother of my children but she's also my best friend. And she's, I, I mean, I, I, I can go through every form of that. And, and, and it's important we know that they aren't separated. God expects us to have friendships. He expects, expects us to have spouses. He expects us to have children. All those dynamics in love are different in and of themselves. But if they're all predicated and permeated with agape love, it changes everything. You can be all in all. Look at our Heavenly Father. He's our Heavenly Father. So store hey, amen? It tells us in Scripture he's our friend. So there's your filet of love. And also, he, when God says he is, the Bible says God is love, it's agape love. It started with that, and everything we do should reflect that in who we are. If when he created us in his image, he sent his son to die the cross for us, both proving his love for us, agape. And as we give our life to him, should not everything we do reflect God's love? Not ours, not our perception of it, but through the Holy Spirit, shouldn't everything we do, every word we say to a neighbor or a friend, or everything that guy just cut me off the freeway, don't wave at him with one finger, look at him and say, praise the Lord. <laughs> Wouldn't it change everything? The guy at the checkout stand, 15 items or less has 21. <laughs> right? Now, by the grace of God and agape love, you do not draw his attention to the sign. You say, can I help you put those up there? <laughs> now, I admit, I have not grown to that point yet. It's one of my pet peeves. And the guy in the freeway, I will chase him to the off-ramp. 
and then feel guilty all the way home. <laughs> but I'm a work in progress. My standard is agape love. I have not completely reached it yet, but I thank God I'm closer today than I was yesterday. And I pray tomorrow I'm one step closer. But my next verse brings me to my next point. Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. The, the, the word there, husband's love, is agape. And the reason that verse is so important to me, we're talking about love. All marriages are to be a picture of Jesus and his people, the church. Our marriages are to reflect the reality of Jesus and the church. Now, this matters to me because in, if you want to turn to Revelation 2, there's a letter to a church of Ephesus, and I think it has real importance. I'll just read the words to you. It says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things say, He who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now listen to these words. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have per persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake, and that have not become weary. Listen to these words. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do those first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolotians, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now let me, you might ask, why does that letter to the church have to do with us individually? You do realize a church isn't a building. Church in, God eye, in God's eyes is a group of believers. Amen? Amen? Every church starts fundamentally with an individual. Multiply that into a family. It takes two individuals before you start a family. A family is the birth of a church. You bring enough families in here. We have individuals, families, and we become a congregation. Amen? Amen. So what's being wrote to this church is being written to us as families and being written to us as individuals. It is application in all three. Now, let, let me tell you what it says. The angel of the church of Ephesus. The angel, and you can, you know, you can debate this. But I believe, and I think doctrinally it's got more back than not, the angel represents the head of the church, the bishop, the pastor, whatever. He brings a word forth to the congregation. So there, there are, in Asia Minor, there were seven specific churches these letters were written to. But the application isn't just for that church, it's for us today. So it could be written to Pastor Rex or whoever it might be saying this about the church. He who holds, and if you go back to Revelation 1, it tells the vision John had, and Jesus was standing in the midst of seven lampstands, and he had seven stars in his hand. And it goes on to say those stars represent those angels, which would be the seven pastors of these seven churches. And the lampstands represents the light. The reason for the church to begin with, we were to be the light in the dark world. Amen? And it goes on to tell what he thought about this particular church in Ephesus. And I love the compliments. You ever, <laughs> you ever go home and your wife says, I love the way you do this, and oh, you're the greatest this, and you're that, but you don't know. I mean, there's always that but in there, isn't there? I mean, <laughs> you, don't you? It's like an apology. I am so sorry, but it never would have happened. If, I mean, there's, there's <laughs> always... There's always that, that there's a distinction that just buries it. But listen to this. Listen, listen to the attributes, if you, were, if you will. I, know, I mean, if this is not, it just builds your ego up. 
If I was reading this individually, family, or as a church, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. You have tested those who say they are apostles or not, and you have found them liars. But listen to this. And you have persevered. You have patience. You have labored for my name's sake, and you have not become weary. Now, just, just kind of twist those words when you say you cannot bear those who are evil, things that come against your marriage, whatever they might be, uh, any of those things. But, but if your wife was telling you that, I have found that you have persevered. Jack, you have patience. You have labored for our marriage, and you have not become weary. Would, would not you just sit there and think, yeah. I mean, wouldn't you just think, man. It, but then the word, the next word, nevertheless. <laughs> well, well, wait, it's not going in the right direction, guys. <laughs> nevertheless, I have this against you. You, that you have left your first love. Now, I'm, I'm really bothered. If you think about this, he just gave you all these attributes of what you do do, which I would get the indication you're serving the Lord. Amen? I mean, you're, 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 you persevere, you work hard, you, you do away, you have nothing to do with what's evil. I mean, man, I, I'm, really, I'm really serving the Lord. Lord, I'm working for you. What more do you want me to do? I'll sweep the parking lot. But, but you get that, that framework. And then he goes on and gets to the root of the problem. He says you've left your first love. See, it, it shifted what they were doing from agape back down to the fundamental surface level. What they were doing, they were doing out of obligation and responsibility, not out of love for their God. See, remember that first time you proposed to your wife and you just, you just got giddy waiting for the answer? You had this passion, this desire. I mean, your, your life was just spinning with expectation and excitement. And, 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 and the Lord, back when you first got saved, remember the, they always make fun of brand new Christians. They want to go to the mission field. They want to change the world. Give them six months and... Uh, I'll put the hymnals out in the, in the pews. I, I mean, they change, amen? But, but they shouldn't. That's what the Lord's saying. You've, you're doing great works, but you forgot that passion, that love you had back at the beginning. You turned it into obligation and responsibility. You go to church because that's what we do. You get burned out and disillusioned because you're doing it because you think God wants you to or you should. It should be out of love for him, not out of responsibility. If you get up on Sunday morning and come to church because you think you should or you think God will be mad at you if you don't, stay home. If you want to come to church to hear about the word of God and about a God that loves you and imparts the Holy Spirit to you so you can understand that love, then praise the Lord. Read five chapters. It's not to get a toaster. You read five chapters to find out how much God loves you. See, this is the reality. When we take it out of love, it's like helping your wife with the dishes. Not that that's a great analogy. But, but let me ask you this. Women, if your husband came up in the midst of you washing dis dishes and he said, honey, sit down, let me do this for you. You've done enough today. Would it not melt her heart? Or, men, if you come up and wash the dishes because you want to buy tickets to the Laker game and, and you're somehow manipulating this or trying to score points, then you're missing the whole purpose of what God's saying. If you can see your wife's tired over there and you could do a little something to her help and you can get up out of your recliner and turn off the sports channel, well, you can leave it on and listen, but, but <laughs> nevertheless, I've told you, I'm not completely there yet. I'm working on it. My idea of taking my wife to a romantic restaurant for a holiday for Valentine's Day, I make sure the restaurant and behind her is that white panel of TV with a game on and I can sit there and stare in my wife's eyes and see every speck of that game. Yeah, praise the Lord. Like I say, I'm not proud, not my proudest moment, but I'm getting there. <laughs> but nevertheless, without agape love, it becomes just strictly compulsionary. I do it because I think I should. 
I come to church because people will wonder why I'm not there. Let me ask you this. Do you look at coming to church the same way you look at going on vacation? I mean, most of us were honest, no. But let's say you were going to Hawaii day after tomorrow. Isn't there an expectation and excitement every I'm one day out? Oh, what do you think the flight's going to be like? Where are, we, are we going to Maui? Are we going to... I mean, there's a sense of excitement that's just building up inside you because this is just going to be great. Shouldn't it be the same? We're going to sit and hear about the God that loves you. Amen. When I went to the, the mission field for a while, I used to get made fun of. Me and my wife are really close. I would buy a card over in Kenya. And you're not by phones very often, but when you, when you can get by a pay phone over there, you can use this international card. And I don't care if we were just driving through a little village that happened to have one little phone there. I make them stop so I can call my wife. I just want to say, I love you, honey. She just, and they make fun of me. I'm like, God, you're only going to be gone two weeks. I mean, can't you <laughs> grow up, Jack? It's just two weeks. She would give me letters before I left for the, the trip. And I'm, op I'm to open one every day and read it. I would sit there by the end of the day with anticipation, right? That when I get back to wherever we're staying, I'm going to read this letter. And I would hinge on every word of it as though she was here with me. Oh, yeah, I know what she means. I, I, I remember that. I, and it was just excitement and expectation of when I get back, what I have with her. Shouldn't it be the same in our relationships? Shouldn't it be the same in our relationship with God? Why is it we've become so perfunctionary, just doing what we're supposed to do for the reasons it says to do it with absolutely no heart in it? Let's see, if we understand Christ and grow closer to him, it, you know, and, and when it talks about Jabez asking for, to increase his territory, uh, that's a loose paraphrase. Maybe we need to increase our hearts with a deeper understanding of agape love. If we can love each other, we can love our families, even our enemies. Scripture tells us even to love our enemies. If we could truly learn to do that the way God wants us to do it with agape love, it would turn this world around. We would see churches on fire. This letter is an indictment. It says, if you do not remember from which you've fallen, think back. Think of your marriage. If you've been married for any length of time. How many in here have been married 20 years? Wow. 30 years. How come more hands went up in 30 than 20? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just curious. We got a county about 40 years. Wow. You guys need prayer when this is up. But no, go ahead. <laughs> All right. Praise the Lord. If you've been married for any length of time and you consider your marriage a good marriage, then I would believe you would pursue that to keep it a good marriage. But unfortunately, when I do marriage counseling, you'll get people that come in and have been married for 20 years, and they don't know what happened. They just don't talk anymore, and it's just not what it used to be. And there's no communication. There's, there's, they, they, he will tell me, hey, I pay the bills, I go to work, I mow the yard, okay? She goes, I take care of the kids, I fix the food, and I do the laundry. And that's their expectation and their understanding of their roles in marriage. And they're doing it, but there's no joy in that house. There's no love in that house. They're just performing a duty. They're married, that's what they're supposed to do. And, and again, without agape love, that's what a marriage becomes. Now let's just kind of take that to its natural end in a church. If we're not coming here for the reason of loving God first and foremost and loving each other second and still foremost, and thirdly, loving an, an unbelieving world that we can reach, if we're not coming here for that reason and we're just coming here to do what we need to do and saying we serve God, the church never grows, and I don't mean numerically, I mean, we never have an effect on the community around us. We never, we never produce any fruit. A church without agape love becomes barren and unfruitful. A marriage without agape love becomes barren and unfruitful. 
The reason we're not watching people is because when you go to the door and say, and you got that flyer that's telling about Jesus, and you walk to the front door and say, do you want one of these or not? You know, I mean, <laughs> chances are you're not going to get the response you want. Amen? But if you go with an excitement and you think there's a chance that you can show the truth of Jesus Christ in this person's life, and you walk to the front door, you got a few minutes? I just thought I could pray for I mean, whatever it might be that God would give you the words to say, it could change his life, it can change your life. But without agape love, it's just you're performing a duty. My wife told me I had to go, and I'm going to go pass out 80 of these, and you run from door to door and chuck them at the front door. You know, and you, <laughs> Then you walk back in the church and say, yeah, I, I went to 80 different ones and delivered them, praise the Lord. You know, And you go home trying to feel good by yourself. Lord, you must be proud of me. I mean, I earned something here. You're not doing this for him. He's doing it for you. He's giving you the ability to be his extension, his, his words, his legs, his feet. That it, it, and it's such a privilege if we just truly understood what it is. Let me close with this. And just, just listen to, to these words. Without agape love, our passionate love affair with our Lord and Savior turn into nothing but a mere religion. Isn't that so true? Listen to it again. Our passionate love affair with our Lord and Savior without agape love turns into nothing but a mere religion. Now listen to this statement. Our passionate love affair with our spouse without agape love turns into a mere marriage. Think about that. When you first got married, remember the excitement? Remember how you're just thinking, God, life does not get any better than this. Amen? And I know things change and all, but shouldn't our love grow and not dissipate? Shouldn't it get more and deeper understanding as we go? Amen, absolutely. But a marriage, I mean, um, a love affair between you and your spouse without a godly love, indeed, turns into a mere marriage. And let's go to friendships with those around you, this congregation. Friendships without agape love just turns into acquaintances. Oh, I know him. Hey, Neil. Hey, I mean, I, I know them. But with agape love, they're my brother in Christ that I love. It, it changes everything who we are. It changes our demeanor, the words we say and how we say it. Think about your, your raising your children. I mean, I have eight of them. I would like to sit here and tell you I've done everything perfectly right. <laughs> but then I'd have to ask for prayer for lying because I probably did <laughs> more wrong than I did right. And by the grace of God, he was my buffer. But let me ask you this. When you're dealing with dynamics like raising children and you really don't know what to do, and it's by the grace of God what you're saying to that child, is it predicated with, or permeated with love? I mean, you can say something and crush a person or build them up with the same words. How many times have you been irritated? I mean, your wife could ask you what time it is. It is 3 o'clock. Now, technically, you were right, and it is 3 o'clock, right? I have this, again, pet peeve. I have a lot of pet peeves. <laughs> but if you ask me what time it is at 3.05, and you ask me five minutes later what time it is. Okay, <laughs> five minutes ago was 3.05, so do the math here. <laughs> it's 3.10, but if you're going to ask me again, I probably would say, five minutes later, it's 3.10. And there's a little sarcasm. I, I believe sarcasm is a spirit. Uh, at least I shouldn't say that. I always tell my wife, sarcasm is a spiritual gift. It's really not. I'm just saying that <laughs> in humor. But... But I can be sarcastic almost, in any, and my wife would say, you really need to, to curtail that completely. But, but how we speak to our spouses, how we speak to our children, will either build them up or tear them down. I mean, how many times have we said something to a child that did something really dumb? Are you kidding me? Are you a moron? <laughs> I, I mean, and, and, and I know that at the time you said it, you're caught up in the emotion. But do we think about the words that we say before we say it? 
again, it could either build you up or it can tend. There, there's a time for to criticize in a godly manner to build up. I understand that. I mean, if your child goes off the rails, you can't say, praise the Lord, go do some more. No, I understand <laughs> that you've got to reel them in, but you reel them in with love. You give them hope. You give them a direction. You don't undermine them. Bury them. Man, if my wife would have kicked me to the curb every time I did something wrong, every time I put my foot in my mouth, every time I didn't do this when I should have did it and did it when I shouldn't have done it, I would have no hope. But by the grace of God and the God be loved, God gave her grace with me and me grace with her. Well, I'll close with, with this. In the verse 4 when it says, Nevertheless, have, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. And the most important part of that portion of scripture is the word left. And it gives us such hope. And let me explain what I mean. If you go out here and for dinner after church and you want company, just call me. I'll go with you. No, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no if you go out for lunch after church and you're on your way home after your dinner or lunch, whatever it might be, and you realize your wallet is not with you. Now, would it make a world of difference whether you left your wallet or you lost your wallet? See, if you left something, you can go back and retrieve it. If you lost something, you've got no, you may have hope, but you have no certainty that you're going to find what you lose. And it matters here because when God said you left your first love, it gives us hope we can come back to what we left. What we're not doing now that we did at the beginning, we didn't lose it. We just need to go back to it. It's all the difference in the world. It, 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 it's such dynamic if you think about it. Well, I've done this wrong so long, I have no hope. You do have hope. You go back to what you did at the beginning, when the passion was there, the, 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 the desire to do it was there. You just go back from where you started, and God would fill, be the buffer and fill the gap. That's what's so great about this portion of scripture. We can sit here and every one of us can think, well, I do pretty good in this area, but I don't do where the darn in this one. I'm pretty harsh with this, and I'm not what God would want me to be over here, and I don't really answer what he puts in my heart to do because I'm just busy, whatever it might be. But so God tells you that's okay. The reason I'm putting this portion of scripture in here is just to remind you, if you want to go back to what I want it to be, and have that fruit, that, that excitement, the blessings of God, the peace that surpasses all understanding. If you want that in your life, then just come back to me. That's all he's asking this morning, is just to come back to me. You know, love's not that complicated, and I know there's four terms, but, but I mean, if you just cut to the chase, God is love, and it's agape love. And that is what we are to aspire to achieve to the very best of our ability. We will never be perfect and we will never measure up. But I guarantee you when God calls you home, he wants you to be closer to what he wanted from the beginning then than when you started. You know, when, when you get to heaven, there's only two questions God's going to ask. Number one is your name in the book of life. And praise the Lord, if it is, you're in heaven, amen? Those pearly gates open, and, and, and you're in heaven. The second question he's going to ask you is, when he's going to look at it, when were you saved? 31 years ago. What did you do with the truth of my son? What did you do in those 30 years? I mean, it's as simple as that. How many people did you tell? How many people did you bring? And if you're going to sit there before a holy God and say, well, I was good with my kids, I, I earned a good living, bought two houses, and you know that Beamer I wanted for so long? I finally got it. <laughs> I guarantee you God is not going to care about any of those things. But when he hears that, that I served you to the best of my ability, I shared as much as I could share. I tried to reflect your love in me. The people around me saw the glory of Jesus. 
You know, and people should flock to you. I mean, in all honesty, when you're walking right with the Lord, there's an air about you. There's a sense of just peace about you. And it is so evident to everyone around you. I mean, you can be going through a, a very horrendous time right now. It could be illness. It could be loss of work. It could be whatever it might be, pandemic. But when people see you have the peace of God that surpasses understanding, that you have this hope in you that makes no sense at all, they're going to flock to you and say, you know, I'm going through the same thing, and I don't understand how you can handle this. I don't understand how you can have hope. I don't, and, the, and, and the door is wide open. Let me tell you about a God that gave me this hope. Let me tell you about a God that shows you a, a future you would never believe. So I guess my question is that this morning is wherever you are with the Lord, he's calling you back. You know, you, you, you've done great up to here and praise the Lord, and I hope you're walking just as happily with the Lord that you ever have. But if not, he's asking you, remember then and what you are now? I want you back. I'm a jealous God. I want your undivided attention. I want your love to be like my love. I want it to be sacrificial. I want my will to be greater than your will, speaking for the Lord. So this morning, I'm going to ask the worship team to come. I'm going to ask Pastor Rex to come up. And as they play, if you're here this morning, and I truly believe you are a child of God, and if not, this morning is the greatest day in your life that you can become a child of God. Come for salvation, but if you're already saved, but somehow, some way, you've drifted away from the Lord. It's more just out of obligation and responsibility what you do or you don't do, whether it's in relationships at home, whether your relationship with God, whether it's serving God, he just kind of shifted. Becoming the church of Laodicea, just lukewarm. I mean, you're not a pagan. You're not against God. You're just not really doing much for God. So my prayer this morning is God just searches your heart. And you want a brand new beginning? You're just a prayer away from getting God right back to where you need to be. So as they play, please, if, if you need prayer, and you want to rededicate your life, you just want to get right with the Lord, Whatever it might be, we're here for you. Let's all stand. Lord, you are amazing, clothed in majesty. All of heaven and earth declare your glory. Jesus Christ. You're part of his family. 
and truly you can experience agape love in a way you can't even imagine. Now, Father, we thank you for the service this morning. We thank you for the privilege of being under this tent. We thank you for your word. And Father, I pray you would give us a fresh understanding of your agape love that we might attain or at least desire to be more of your image each and every day. So Father, go before us today and let everything we say and everything we do glorify you. And all the people said, amen. amen. God bless you. Go out, have a good Valentine's dinner. Could be my wife's uh, song, I guess. Yeah. <laughs>